This is a podcast from ABC Local Radio Overnights. I'm Rod Quinn. Tori Amos is one of America's leading singer-songwriters with a very distinctive ethereal style. Her first album came out more than 20 years ago and since then she's become one of the most thought-provoking artists in pop music. Her latest album is called Unrepentant Geraldines which features a duet with her 13-year-old daughter. Now, due to copyright restrictions, we can't play you that duet, but I began my conversation with Tori Amos by asking her about writing that song and how the duet with her daughter came about. Well, we were talking about teenage girls and their moms and a relationship whereby a mom doesn't always say that she knows what's best. And we started talking about how... How do we communicate so that we're able to listen to each other even if we don't agree? And that was the beginning of a conversation that lasted many, many months and then turned into a song. And I can understand, you know, reading the lyrics and hearing you sing that and your daughter sing it as well. But was it always going to be there for a duet with her? Well, it only seemed natural that because the genesis came from many conversations and then organically turned into a song. Right. We sing together a lot. It's just something we've been doing since she was tiny. She'll just crawl up on the piano wherever we are. Even if we're touring, she'll sit beside me. I usually have a keyboard in the hotel room. And we'll just sing. Sing anything. And many musicians, though, uh, like to keep their children out of the business. I mean, is this just a one-off, do you think, on record? Or do you think that she's now interested enough to possibly make her own records or appear on other uh, songs of yours? It's a funny thing because most musicians don't want their kids in the business because, because we know what it is. And especially now. There isn't a lot of longevity if you look around you. There are not a lot of people that hang around for 25 years in the music industry anymore, do you see? So it's a very strange business to be involved in. And that's why you get most parents thinking, oh, please, anything but this, anything. (laughs) And yet it's one of those things where the more as a parent you say, no, 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 it becomes more attractive. And when a kid gets the bug, it's that music, picking up a guitar at all hours, in the middle of the night, you know, you hear, Mark and I will be half asleep and we'll hear that guitar going and we'll think, oh no, (laughs) (laughs) not at two in the morning. (laughs) But that's the thing, we don't know where it's going, if I'm honest with you. It's just right now, something that she's doing in her own little room. She has her own Pro Tools rig. Her dad's an engineer, so she she knows that skill. So she makes her own little demo tapes, and she's just doing her own thing for her own satisfaction right now. She has such a sophisticated voice for a girl so young. Well, it was very strange. She was on holiday with my sister, and one of her cousins walked in and said, Who's the 30-year-old talking to her in the shower, Mom? To my sister. And it's just one of those strange things because she doesn't sound like anybody in the family. I mean, I sound like a fairy on crack, and she certainly doesn't sound like me. She's got her own thing. She sounds fantastic. What did you sound like when you were her age? Like a kid. I mean, it took me a long time to develop a vocal style. It wasn't very sophisticated. And I had to work really hard at it, whereas she's she's worked hard at it, but she listens to very different music than I than I used to. She listens to blues and soul and that that kind of music. Yeah. And I was listening more to um, Robert Plant, Led Zeppelin, mm-hmm. Joni Mitchell, you know, those types of records. And then I turned pro. I was playing piano bar on a regular basis. I started at 13, but then moved into it at 14 and 15. So that really began to develop my chops, my vocal chops. Mm. But I started as a piano player at two and a half. Two and a half. What kind of things were you playing on the piano at two and a half? Well, my mom says that I could hear something and play it back. So they would put phone books on the piano stool so I could reach the keys. And um, they would just play me something and I'd play it back. She would just play me anything. From Frank Sinatra, for example, my brother would come and play me the Beatles and I would 
hear it and play it back to them. You would be um, used to that if your daughter was doing that now. What was your mother's reaction, though, when you were doing it? The strange thing and the blessing, I guess, was because my father was a minister. They were exposed to a big congregation, and they started talking to people, and word got around, and there happened to be musicians that went to the church that gave my parents advice and said, you need to get her into the conservatory. So there was um, the Peabody Conservatory, which is now part of Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, and I got accepted at five years old on a scholarship. And the great thing about that, I guess, Rod, was that I was surrounded by musicians and people who, who were sharing how they hear music and how they learn to read music. And I think that that was a part of my background that I didn't value until much yeah. later in life when I realized had I not gone... I wouldn't have the skills that I needed, for example, to write a musical. Most pop stars or rock stars, if you want to use that term, do not know how to read and write music. How do you think that affected your songwriting, the fact that you can? I think it's probably been the secret in my arsenal because I was forced to analyse other people's um music by by reading it not just by listening so you would have your training and listening courses but you had to have theory courses and one of my favorite types of teaching was when you would have to analyze someone's score so over the years i've been forced to analyze all kinds of things but by doing that you begin to learn some of the i don't know if you call it tricks but some of the ways that they would come up with their ideas that's changed my life as a as a writer to be able to see, oh, so this is how they used this pattern and this is how this theme reoccurs and maybe this is how they figured it out. <laughs> so you begin to understand how they figure it out. Yeah. Our guest is Tori Amos. Now, you mentioned Led Zeppelin. Not a lot of people get in trouble for playing Led Zeppelin in church, but you did. Well, if you think about it, back in the day, they were really quite um, disruptive to certain families because a lot of teenage girls were running away to go follow them. Mm. I remember my father talking to me about the impact that some of these bands were having on, quote unquote, American values, you know, Christian, American Christian (laughs) principles. And I was a little kid. Um, But so I was just hearing about all this hullabaloo happening, thinking, wow, that's pretty powerful stuff. If these bands are able to get these teenage girls to run away from their families to just follow them, the music was having that effect. And I started to think, wow, so what are they up to? And then I started listening, and I realized that I became a huge fan of the music and thought it was some of the most beautiful guitar and melodic combinations with Jimmy and Robert together, that it was actually quite gorgeous. Um, And so as as an eight-year-old, I was studying that music. And playing it. And playing it. Oh, yeah. (laughs) How you do that, you've got to hide that you're playing (laughs) So if you're play, if you're playing at a funeral, for example, and you're having to have 30 minutes of music, you you've got to do a variation on the theme so that nobody, except maybe a teenage boy sitting there, knows what you're up to. <laughs> but somebody must have found out at some point. At some point, I think I think that it was shocking, so that word got out. But you know, you just have to keep a poker face and deny, <laughs> deny, deny. I saw something recently also where you chose Led Zeppelin IV as your favourite album of all time. Why that one? Well, the truth is I wanted to choose the box set because I just think that that is, if you have a long car journey, if you're driving across Australia or across the States, you just want to put that on and it'll get you to the coast. If you start on the East Coast in America, in the whole box set will get you wow. to the West Coast. And I've, I've, I've driven across the country many times. And I just think that, um, you know, I've met Robert and I've met Jimmy, and I think that they just were able to deliver consistently great records, along, of course, with, you know, John Bonham and yeah. John Paul Jones. Mm. What a band. 
looking at your set list that you've been going through on um, this current tour and that you'll be bringing to Australia very soon, you do a lot of covers. Do you cover Led Zeppelin? There is a song I cover called Thank You. I'm cautious about covering them, though. In in the early days, maybe 1991, 92, I did a whole a whole lot of love cover. But I'm cautious about it because I think that Thank You is one of the better covers I've done. So you let that stand. Too much of a good thing yeah. and, and it doesn't work anymore. I'm quite ruthless about what covers I do. You have to be really strict on yourself for it to work. A lot of things I like necessarily I shouldn't be covering because the type of voice I have, you have to cast yourself. You can't think, oh, I'm going to hurt my feelings again. You just have to say self. You have no business singing that. You can't bring anything to this song, so be smart. Don't touch it. And with that kind of, I don't know, micromanaging, (laughs) then people will suggest that I cover something. And a lot of times these are requests. But, you know, listening to your album Strange Little Girls, where you cover a whole lot of songs, and they are not in the standard way that people would cover songs and quite often just give a, a you know a carbon copy of the original, you do a very different versions of those songs. Are you saying that there are some songs you couldn't do for your own voice? You just have to rearrange them? Well, there are certain things that you think, and it, and it could be because it's similar to what I do. It might be okay. something, and I think, mm, there's nothing I can bring to this. And so it doesn't mean I don't love it. I might really love a song. Right. But I'll think, no, I don't, I, I'm not the person. There's another artist out there that should be covering this. Also looking at your set lists, it seems like you do a different set list every night. You have songs from all parts of your career. You know, I saw Bob Dylan recently. He played the same set list not only every night in Australia, but every night on his world tour. Tell me why you vary it so much. I feel like I have this opportunity each night to be really present with an audience. And there are hundreds and hundreds of songs in the catalogue. If you think that you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of these songs, that you can have a a different narrative every night. What happens is I stand at the stage door in in the afternoon and see people for a couple hours to get a sense of the mood of the day. People bring stories of their travels, of what's happening that day. And that way, don't you see, then you're present for Brisbane. You're not back in Adelaide. But when you're in Adelaide, you're really, really there. And so you're not reliving Sydney because there's no need to. Sydney, you've played Sydney, yeah. you stood at the stage door, you had those conversations. And in order to be present, in order, in my opinion, for me to be really awake on that stage and not think about this, if you're doing many, many shows, I need each night to be distinctive so I'm not confused where I am. This is just something I've had to learn to do since I was two and a half, how Any other artist does it is how they do it. But you have to remember, I played piano bar since I was 13 years old. Until I was 26, Mm. that's how I had to make a living, six nights a week. I had to keep it different. That's how people would come see me from night to night. Well, also, a lot of your fans are going to want to see every show, and they are going to see something different every night. Well, the goal is if you come to more than one show that you have a different experience. And so if you come to a show and then you think, okay, I'm going to go bring my friend to this other show, that you don't feel like you've seen it all before. I mean, there there are going to be some songs that are sort of like, if you, you can imagine, pillars. They're sort of the bookends, possibly. So it's an entry point in. We begin the show the same way every night with the same song. But then you can go anywhere, and that's the idea. Tori Amos is our special guest, and she'll be touring Australia. And in fact playing with the Sydney Symphony for a couple of nights at the Opera House. I know you've played at the Opera House before, but are those symphony shows going to be different to uh, the other shows on the tour? Oh, yes. (laughs) Oh, yes, and they need... I have to start practising right now (laughs) to be ready. I find it interesting because one of the things I also read about this album was your daughter wanted you to rock out, to stop working with an orchestra or stop doing covers, but do, you know, an old-fashioned kind of rock album, an old-fashioned Tori Amos album... And here you are working with an orchestra again. Well, she wanted me to tour out there on my own, 
which I've been doing. I've done 63 shows doing that. Wow. She wanted me to go rock <laughs> at a piano with no band. Yeah. The whole issue was I was turning 50, and she said, look, you can prove to yourself that you have as much power as you did 20 years ago. You have to prove this. You're not 84. You're not Grandma Mary. So it was a distinction. That was all part of our promise conversations. She would say to me, Mom, promise that you're not going to say you're getting old. I don't see you that way. Come to terms with it. Get your head around this and go rock. So that's where that was coming from. When you play with an orchestra, you can still rock out. It's a different discipline. What you can't do is jam. Orchestras don't jam. Everything is on the page. So if you come off that page, then you're going to fall off. And that's really embarrassing. <laughs> so you have to be very strict. You see, it's a very different discipline than when you're playing by yourself. Now, one of the things that I've always thought about your records is they are incredibly put together. You seem to take an extraordinary amount of effort to get the packaging of the CDs right, whether it's the one for Scarlet's Walk, the sort of deluxe edition of that, even the latest one of um, Unrepentant Geraldine's, um, thinking about Abnormally Attracted to Sin, The Beekeeper is a beautiful production as well. Quite often there's a DVD with it as well as just the CD. How important is it that the CD case, especially these days in an era of downloads where people just get the music and nothing else, that the packaging needs to be so beautiful? Every facet has to be the best it can be, or why are you even participating? Whoever you are, whatever you're doing, why can't you bring the very best of every aspect that you do? I just don't understand any other way. Where is your self-respect, and where is your respect for the audience member who is investing in this. I have to be honest, our market is more 70% of the physical packaging than it is the digital because I want to give people a little treasure. I think it's really important. I always loved little books, you know, tiny little treasures. They've always just been something I've collected, so I wanted to try and, and give that to people in return. We have a lot of fun doing it. It takes a lot of effort, but that's okay. That's okay. I, I love doing it. Well, you can tell that. It's obviously crafted with love. I think they're beautiful. I think the Beekeeper is one of the most beautiful CD packages I've ever seen. There's just something about a Tori Amos record that just makes it special. Now, one of the other things I've noticed also is the number of people you thank on your albums. You seem to be a very grateful person, a very gracious person as well. And um, on the latest one, you thank your dentists, who are the greatest dentists in the solar system, or indeed maybe the molar system. I'm not sure. Um <laughs> Tell me about your dentists. Well, I don't know if anybody else thinks this, but when you travel the world and you're on tour sometimes for months and months and months and months out of a time, when you find a good dentist office, <laughs> you want to hold on to them and tell the world. So if you're ever in West Palm Beach or that area of Florida, <laughs> You've got to find Dr. Roberts because and Antoinette is a goddess. She runs the office. She's originally from New York, so she's a New Yorker. She has a fabulous accent. But she'll just sort you out, whatever you need. And when you find people like this, you just want other people to know. And there's so many people to thank. Think about it. Making a record, even though there are very few people in the studio, there's so many people, extended people that make something like that happen and people involved in the packaging and all that there are just so many fairies running around helping out <laughs> I'm also interested in, in many of your songs and they have the greatest song titles uh, do you sometimes think of a title and write a song afterwards something like uh, The Power of Orange Knickers that to me is one of the great song titles of all time <laughs> it's odd how these things happen because I can't really plan for them Sometimes they just happen because as a songwriter, you always have your ear to the ground. Somebody says something and then it becomes a song or something happens and all of a sudden you're running around for a napkin or a piece of paper. It used to be bills. In the old days, a phone bill would come in and I would be writing a song on the back of a phone <laughs> bill just because an idea comes to you, but you can't plan for it. That's what's so crazy about 
being a songwriter, being around songwriters, you have to kind of know that you're under a microscope all the time. I mean, I tell people, if if you don't want to end up in a song, then don't say anything. <laughs> end up in one. But I never tell who they are. I don't come forth and say who it's about. Has anyone ever asked to be in one of your songs? Uh, no. They don't ask. I think it's it's just known that you just might end up in one. Because I'm, I'm up front about it. Yeah. I'm not covert about it. So your husband must be very careful about what he says to you because he's going to end up in one of your songs. But he's not careful at all. <laughs> He knows. He just knows it's part of the. Yeah. It's well. It's just part of the deal. Yeah. Living with him. I think artist. he's a good sport. I mean, because he, he's so shy, and I've, I kind of feel sorry for him sometimes because he's so shy and hides from the world. As far as he's not a social butterfly. He's an Arsenal fan. He rides a motorcycle. It's just, ugh. but of all people, he could have kind of paired up with I think it's funny at least uh, he's not a Manchester United fan uh, we can at least be thankful of that Tori Amos about to tour Australia again I really appreciate it it's been such a delight talking to you I've been such a fan for a long time and I hope you have a great time out here in Australia again and thank you so much thank you I can't wait to come Well, that's another podcast from ABC Local Radio Overnights. I'm Rod Quinn. Thanks for listening.